following program is brought to you by Caltech. So now it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Jonathan Lunin. He is a professor of physics at the University of Rome, Tor Vagata. He is uh, on leave from the University of Arizona in Tucson. He is the David Baltimore Distinguished Scientist, Visiting Scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He is a he is an interdisciplinary scientist on the Cassini mission, as well as the James Webb Space Telescope. He is also the author of over 230 scientific papers, as well as two books. One of the books is called Earth, The uh, Evolution of a Habitable World, and the other book is Astrobiology, an Interdisciplinary Approach. He is also a fellow of the um, American Advancement for the Associate, uh, Association of Sciences. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. And just this year, he was elected to membership for the US National Academy of Sciences. He received his Bachelor of Science in Physics at the University of Rochester in 1980. And he received his PhD in planetary sciences here at the California Institute of Technology in 1985. His scientific research interests center broadly on planetary evolution and the origin. And it's a great pleasure to introduce him as our short course speaker for this morning. So Professor Jonathan Lunin, please give, join me in giving me him a warm welcome. This room has everything in it except a clock, is that right? Yep, that's right. Oh, there is, look at that, okay, indeed, thank you. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've actually never been in this building, but when I was a graduate student, I would sometimes go study in the old Robinson Library with uh, the smells of all the mold and everything, and uh, the noises of ghosts at night and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> that was, I, you know, that was sort of more intimate than this. But this is a beautiful building. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, the workshop this week. I hope that um, this will give us a chance to uh, think up new and innovative ways to explore uh, not only what is an extreme environment in the solar system, but as I'll try to argue, one of the most important places to explore in the solar system, and that's Saturn's moon Titan. Now, um, I, I also want to apologize ahead of time because the idea of having to listen to somebody for uh, nearly two hours without a break uh, is sort of mind-boggling. And uh, I guess, and then to have a break and have to listen to the same person again for another half hour. So uh, what I would encourage people here to do is to actually interrupt with questions. And of course, uh, we all know that that's not a foreign concept at Caltech. And that happens anyway, even when people are told not to do that. So that'll be a great way to derail me. And after a whole bunch of questions, I'll have to skip over another 25 slides to get back on schedule. And uh, that will avoid um, anyone in the room going insane from having to listen to me for this period of time. But hopefully, the subject will carry itself. So the plan of this short course uh, is as follows. Uh, I, I really did not have a good idea of who was going to be here because, uh, as Jennifer and Mohammed said, this is really, um, and, and Michelle, who, uh, I, by the way, I, I have un, undying admiration for Michelle, who has sort of guided this whole Keck thing and made it all work, uh, along with Tom Prince and uh, the advisory board. So she deserves a great hand in advance for all this. Uh, but I didn't have any idea who was going to be here. You know, it's an open session. It's not the workshop participants. 
So you never really know what that means. In Pasadena, it usually means people who have some understanding of science, uh, but it could be anyone from just JPL and Caltech crowd to people coming in uh, from uh, uh, off the street, from Lake Avenue somewhere. So I apologize if this is going at too low a level or uh, too high a level. I suspect from looking at the audience that the former is going to be the problem. Um, so maybe I'll speed through it more quickly than I otherwise would have. But I do want to start with the basics of Titan so that we're all on the same page. And then what I've tried to do is to pick things that I think are some of the highlights in this period of time and which pertain specifically to the goal of the workshop, which is the development of new techniques for in situ exploration of Titan. Uh, and so I think a number of uh, those in the audience may find that they would have picked other topics, and that's quite natural. But uh, the hydrologic cycle, the methane hydrologic cycle on Titan, is the sort of unifying theme that uh, now halfway through the Cassini missions, plural, uh, clearly is uh, the most important and distinguishing aspect of Titan. So I want to spend some time on that. And then there are some recent interesting uh, observations that show that the hydrologic cycle really is active, including seasonal polar changes, uh, some interesting ideas uh, actually coming from here at Caltech on longer term uh, changes on tens of thousands of year cycles associated with orbital changes. Uh, and then there is a question about changes over geologic time. And, and there is uh, something of a dichotomy in the view of Titan, uh, whether Titan is this uh, cold and dead world somewhat like Jupiter's moon Callisto, which just happens to have an atmosphere and has atmospheric effects associated with that, uh, and, and therefore might be a, a place that has a very thick crust and very little liquid in its interior. Or is it an active icy moon uh, with a thin crust and with uh, continuous activity uh, of some kind? And of course, the answer is we don't know. But I want to talk about some of the hints uh, that uh, probably work in both directions in terms of changes over geologic time. And that's going to segue into uh, one model for the internal evolution of Titan, uh, which happens to correspond to one that I've worked on. It's one of several, but I think it's illustrative of some of the potential complexity that uh, might be present uh, in Titan's uh, atmosphere, surface, interior over geologic time. And then finally, uh, in order to keep everybody motivated and awake, I'm going to end with the most outrageous stuff, which is the possibility that um, there might be life on Titan that uh, exists in hydrocarbon liquids, not in liquid water. Uh, it is just simply a hypothesis without any basis, uh, any sort of support at the moment, but it's something that should be considered. And then the notion that Titan is, after all of this, really the place to understand what happens to planets that have their principal volatile, the one that is participating in their hydrologic cycle, in a state of rapid escape, which is something that we do not see for the Earth today, but which will be an inevitable fact for the Earth as the sun's luminosity continues to increase over time, and was perhaps the defining episode in the early evolution of Venus, its loss of water. Uh, we have a chance to study that by understanding the environment of Titan, because methane on Titan is in a similar state of rapid escape. Uh, so if you do want to go to sleep or go out to the patio and drink coffee, uh, there's a different way to get all of this, probably a better way. Uh, there are three books that I'm recommending here. Um, the most technical and most recent of these books is a collection of, of papers that were organized and solicited by the Cassini-Huygens project and came out very recently in a book by Springer entitled Titan from Cassini-Huygens. And uh, it, it's, it's fully up to date. The chapters were all refereed. The references are up to date. Uh, and it's not a conference proceeding in the sense of, of a kind of Astronomical Society of the Pacific publication. It's a set of solicited chapters on specific topics. So very highly recommended. The second of these um, is at a similar level, but is written by two authors and therefore is somewhat more integrated, but also reflects their personal points of view. 
And this is a book published by World Scientific entitled Titan, Exploring an Earth-like World. This is the second edition, so it's only a little bit uh, more out of date than the Springer book. Uh, Athena Kustenis and Fred Taylor uh, are both involved in Cassini, although Athena much more than uh, Fred. And so it's a very authoritative book. Um, also authoritative, but written at a somewhat more popular level, is a book by Ralph Lorenz, who's here and is going to be lecturing this afternoon, and Jacqueline Mitten, entitled Lifting Titan's Veil, Exploring the Giant Moon of Saturn by Cambridge. Uh, the, the important thing about this book is that it describes not only Titan itself, but the anatomy of a space mission, which is the Cassini-Huygens mission. And even though I have been a participant in that mission since its beginning, I actually found it very instructive reading it myself and um, uh, getting Ralph's insights in particular on how missions uh, work, get, get uh, created, how instruments get built. Uh, I think it's a good object lesson uh, for all of us. So these are the three books that I would actually recommend. And you'll notice that I didn't recommend either of my books. So I'm trying to be a really good uh, colleague here. <clears throat> OK, let's start with the basics of Titan. So um, there is this sort of classical story, and I forget whether it's Rabbi Hillel or another rabbi from 2,000 years ago, who is approached by someone who wants to convert to Judaism and is asked, uh, the rabbi is, is in fact, the, it's his demanded by this convert that he teach him all about the Torah while standing on one leg. And depending on the version of the story you hear, either the convert is standing on one leg or the rabbi has to stand on one leg. So of course the rabbi immediately says, talks about, just states the golden rule and, and love your neighbor and so on, and then says the rest is all commentary. So two hours I'm not gonna spend standing on one leg. Um, so if I have to stand on one leg and tell you what the essence of the story is, it's this. It's that Titan is one of four worlds with atmospheres and active volatile cycles. Only Titan and the Earth have open bodies of liquid on their surface. And Titan may be the solar system's example of an extremely common kind of planet in the cosmos, uh, one with a stable environment and methane as the working fluid of the hydrologic cycle. Because M dwarfs are much more common than G dwarfs in the cosmos, and a methane cycle planet is stable at one AU from an M dwarf, whereas something like the Earth is much, much closer in where things are very dynamic. It may be that this is the most stable kind of uh, active hydrologic cycle in the universe. And that's it, the rest is commentary. So um, that's the important take home message. The Titan really is um, important in the solar system from these points of view one of only four worlds with atmospheres and active volatile cycles, but only Titan and Earth have open bodies of liquid and atmospheres of nitrogen. And Titan may, in fact, Titan's environment may be more common in the cosmos than an Earth-type environment. Um, so for those who have not been keeping up with the solar system, which is entirely possible at JPL these days, um, Titan is a moon of Saturn. Uh, it's actually the second largest moon in the solar system. It's shown roughly to the right size here as you would see it through a telescope. Uh, that's actually a Cassini optical image. Uh, relative to these other objects in the outer solar system along with the moon and relative to the Earth. Um, it is uh, smaller, slightly smaller than, than Ganymede. Now it doesn't look like it on this picture, but that statistic actually applies to the solid part of Titan, not to the atmosphere. If you look at this, uh, only the solid surface of Titan, and now this is, a, a, I believe, a composite VIMS image, or maybe another ISS image. Titan is just slightly smaller than Ganymede. Um, this uh, actually is quite striking, uh, the similarity in size between these two objects, as well as Callisto. Ganymede and Callisto are the two outer Galilean moons of Jupiter. Um, and Callisto is a little bit uh, smaller in size um, by a few hundred kilometers or so. But the other striking thing about Titan, Ganymede, and Callisto is they all have roughly this density, about 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter, which uh, is something that was determined for all of those objects definitively in the Voyager flybys of 
1979 and Jupiter in 1980 at Saturn. And uh, what's striking about this uh, is that um, these objects are about 50-50 rock and ice. And because they all have the same size and the same mass to within 10%, um, they all have the same proportion of rock and ice. Uh, and, and that leads one to, to wonder whether, in fact, there is some process uh, that might perhaps be common not only in our own solar system but elsewhere that limits the size of satellites around giant planets. Um, if there is such a process, then, of course, the whole Avatar movie goes out the window because um, Pandora was much bigger than this. But we don't really know. All we know is that we have these three objects, two around Jupiter and one around Saturn, that are all basically the same size. Now, of course, what distinguishes Titan from Ganymede and Callisto is that Titan has a very dense atmosphere, uh, which Ganymede and Callisto do not possess. And so one of the uh, enduring mysteries in the outer solar system, uh, and the question that's most commonly asked after lectures about moons in the outer solar system is, is why is it that Ganymede and Callisto uh, ha are airless, have no evident volatile systems on their surface, uh, whereas Titan does? And the answer is nobody knows, but there, there are theories. Um, you, know, you, can, you can take two different kinds of theories. One is that uh, it's much colder out at Titan and Saturn, and Saturn is less massive than Jupiter, so the disk out of which the satellites form was colder at Saturn than it was at Jupiter, and so uh, volatiles could survive. They could persist. Things like methane uh, could uh, be attached to ices and not simply evaporate away, whereas at Jupiter that was not the case. The other model is uh, that, again, Jupiter is bigger than Saturn, uh, but that's really all that matters. Position in the outer solar system doesn't matter quite so much, and in that case it is that impacts on uh, Ganymede and Callisto were more effective at driving atmosphere away. Uh, now that doesn't really work too well for Callisto, it works for Ganymede. <clears throat> but the other striking thing about these objects, as we'll see in a few minutes, is that the latest gravity results for Titan suggest that unlike Ganymede, which is fully differentiated into a, um, a rocky core, an icy mantle, and, and even a small metal core, inner core within the rocky core, uh, Titan does not appear to be fully differentiated, uh, but um, it has a moment of inertia that's larger than that of Ganymede, but smaller than that of Callisto. And so there's then this progression in terms of the moment of inertia, suggesting something about the degree of differentiation that actually is hard to understand as well, because these bodies are so large that during their formation you'd expect that large amounts of ice would simply have melted and the rock could fall to the center. And so all three should really be differentiated or not. Um, but having this kind of gradual progression is very, very odd and not very well understood. Yes, please. Bruce. Well, that's one interpretation. Yeah, but I think to explain the moment of inertia, you have to go farther and say that the core is hydrated silicates as well, and that you've preserved the, the hydration in the silicates, which is also hard to do. I think getting rid of all the iron doesn't quite do it. I think you have to have some hydrated silicates too. But then you have to ask, why doesn't it have any iron with the rock? So that's another interesting problem. Well, one would expect it does, uh, but Bruce's point is that one way to get around this with a moment of inertia is to take away all the iron. And so you make the quote-unquote silica component less dense, and that would tend to drive up the moment of inertia. Okay, good. We're getting discussion. Fantastic. And then uh, Saturn, uh, Titan in the Saturn system, in the context of the Saturn system, unlike the, the Jovian uh, system of, of Galilean moons, there are not multiple large moons like Titan in the Saturn system. All the other moons are quite a bit smaller, uh, much smaller in mass, smaller in radius, uh, you can see that Rhea and Iapetus are really only um, essentially one-third, uh, even less, the diameter of Titan, much smaller in mass. But again, paradoxically, um, despite the fact that the other moons are quite small in size, 
they seem to have a history of geologic activity, uh, particularly Enceladus, which is active today, uh, which uh, certainly uh, is much, much, uh, uh, much, much more active than uh, either Ganymede or Callisto. So uh, there is perhaps, again, an indication here that volatiles in the interior beyond just water ice have been playing a role in the Saturn system that um, they have not played in the Jupiter system, allowing for more activity on these relatively small satellites. Rhea is about 700 kilometers in radius. Titan, by the way, 2575 kilometers in radius. Uh, and then the Saturn system itself, just to point out that Titan is, is quite a ways out from, from Saturn. Um, there are tidal effects. Titan has an eccentric orbit, a small eccentricity of a few percent, um, but the tidal effects are not very large, uh, and there is no um, multiple large satellite system which can maintain, um, uh, through resonances, uh, eccentric orbits and large amounts of tidal heating, uh, for Titan at least. And then the question of Enceladus, which is much closer in, uh, which does have a very prodigious source of heat, uh, that's an open question as to how much of that is tidal and how that's actually maintained. So it's a much less regular system, a much less tightly coupled system, maybe one where stochastic processes, large impacts, dominated early in the history and led to um, a much larger assortment of bodies than in the Jupiter system. Now, for the rest of this talk, what's very important to remember is the, the vast distance of Titan from the Sun, which determines everything about its properties and is actually the reason why this Keck workshop is happening, because it makes Titan an extreme environment, in this case a low temperature environment. So uh, there's nothing like seeing the solar system on a logarithmic scale. Uh, but here it is, so this is distance, uh, where 1 AU is the Earth-Sun distance. The Earth is here, the effective temperature, these are flipped, this should be 258 Kelvin. And the effective temperature for Titan is, is arguable because the haze plays uh, a role uh, in altering the amount of sunlight that gets to the surface. So it depends on what you actually count in terms of uh, where the sunlight's being deposited and re-radiated. 85 Kelvin would be the number if there were no haze uh, and really no effect from the atmosphere. So this is a very profound difference, and uh, it leads to all of the differences we see between Titan and the Earth, other than the smaller size of Titan. And in fact, it's, it's actually remarkable that Titan is so much like the Earth uh, uh, in terms of the, the manifestation of the physical processes, given that the environment is so different. So um, this is just now a very brief set of historic highlights with a lot of editing involved. In, in fact, not all the spacecraft missions are here either. But just very briefly, Titan was discovered in 1655 by the Dutch uh, astronomer and optical uh, scientist Christian Huygens. Uh, he called it Luna Saturni, moon of Saturn. Uh, it wasn't named Titan until 1847. It was named by the son of the famous astronomer William Herschel. And it wasn't until 1908 that um, astronomers noticing limb darkening uh, on Titan, uh, Coma Sola in particular, a Spanish astronomer, uh, that there was the inference of an atmosphere, that this might in fact be a moon with an atmosphere. And then in 1943, Gerard Kuiper, uh, who had been the director of the Yerkes Observatory and was observing at the McDonald Observatory in Texas, uh, obtained spectra of Titan which showed the presence of methane. Uh, he inferred that this methane was in the atmosphere and that therefore Titan did have an atmosphere. And so he published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal which is generally regarded, uh, notwithstanding Coma Solis's observations, as the discovery paper of an atmosphere uh, on Titan. And from that period of time, for about four decades, there were more optical observations and spectroscopic observations and even some radio observations. There were additional hydrocarbons uh, seen in Titan's atmosphere, um, but not a lot of progress really and a lot of confusion until finally in 1980, Voyager 1 made a very, very close flyby of Titan and was able to do a radio occultation experiment which determined the density with altitude, determined the physical size of Titan, 
and when coupled with the temperature data from the infrared spectrometer, the thermal infrared spectrometer, and compositional data from an ultraviolet spectrometer on Voyager, it was possible to piece together that this was actually a nitrogen atmosphere in which methane was a secondary constituent. The surface pressure um, at the occultation entry and, and egress points was uh, 1.4 atmospheres. The temperature at the surface, uh, about 94 Kelvin. And, um, uh, and methane was, uh, there was a rather broad range of mixing ratios, which turn out, in, in fact, based on Cassini data, to be about 5% methane. So there was a lot of argument prior to that as to whether Titan had a thin atmosphere that was all methane or a very dense atmosphere of nitrogen, perhaps as much as 10 atmospheres uh, with a little bit of methane. And what Voyager 1 found was that it was in between. But the notion that it might, in fact, be an atmosphere of nitrogen, which was put forward prior to Voyager separately by Don Hunton, um, Toby Owen, and to some extent by Daryl Strobel, uh, was uh, confirmed by Voyager 1. Now, there was a Pioneer 11 flyby of the Saturn system in, in 1979. There were temperature measurements of Titan. Not very much was really determined from that. And then a Voyager 2 flyby in 1981, which was actually much more distant. An important point about this flyby, without belaboring the history too much, is that if it had been decided that all of the outer planets should be visited by the Voyager spacecraft, including Pluto, um, we probably would not have a Cassini-Huygens mission today. We wouldn't know many of the fundamentals about Titan's atmosphere. Uh, in fact, it would remain a great mystery today, because um, by directing Voyager 1 close to Titan, that trajectory made it impossible to visit Pluto. And of course, there was a big debate about this at the time that the Grand Tour mission was being done. Um, there was a lot, because of this long history of Titan, there was a lot of persuasive argument in favor of, of doing Titan, and, and that won out. And of course, now there is a spacecraft going to Pluto, so hopefully um, everything that the Grand Tour mission was to have done uh, will be done uh, by the middle of the next decade. But this was crucially important in setting the stage for the Cassini-Huygens mission and the recognition that Titan was a unique object in the outer solar system in terms of having a, a dense atmosphere whose principal component is, in fact, um, the uh, same as in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, whether the nitrogen in Titan's atmosphere has the same origin as that of the Earth's atmosphere is also an open issue. It probably, the, the answer is probably no. All the best evidence is that the nitrogen in Titan's atmosphere is derived from ammonia, and that's based on measurements by the Huygens probe, uh, which I'll mention in a few minutes. This is a very schematic illustration of Titan's atmosphere. And the people who work on Titan's atmosphere are sitting in the audience giggling about this, but, or smirking. But um, it, th the main point about this uh, chart is that the shape of Titan's atmosphere is like the shape of the Earth's atmosphere. The, the change in slope and sign of the slope is uh, very much what we're familiar with in our own atmosphere. So this is pressure in millibars, altitude, and kilometers. Uh, here's the Earth's atmospheric uh, pressure is, um, oh dear, 10 to, the minus, 10 to the 3 is not shown here, but it would be about here. The bottom pressure in Titan's atmosphere, again, about 1 and a half atmospheres. Uh, there is, <clears throat> uh, from the surface temperature at the equator of 94 Kelvin, uh, the temperature drops with altitude. And in fact, most of this atmosphere is in uh, radiative equilibrium, which means that energy is flowing out through radiative processes, absorption and re-emission of photons. Uh, like the Earth's atmosphere, the optical depth in the visible through Titan's atmosphere is significantly less than the optical depth in the infrared. And so while um, a good fraction of the sunlight gets down to Titan's surface, uh, as with the Earth, although in the case of Titan it may only be 10% uh, or even a little bit less than that. Uh, in the infrared, photons uh, travel uh, only a very short distance before they get reabsorbed. And then, of course, when they get absorbed, then new infrared photons get emitted in any random direction. 
And so the progression of, uh, of, uh, thermal, uh, ener of, of, of heat outward, thermal energy outward, is very slow. And this generates a, uh, a greenhouse effect, uh, where the temperature at the surface is elevated by about 10 degrees over and above the effective temperature. It's actually a more dramatic greenhouse effect than that, because there is a substantial haze layer in Titan's atmosphere, uh, which, in fact, has impeded telescopic observation of the surface of Titan for centuries. And uh, this haze layer uh, absorbs uh, a good fraction of the sunlight, most of the sunlight uh, that is in the blue and yellow part of the spectrum, and only admits that in the red part of the optical spectrum. So when you take account of that, you notice that the temperature minimum here is at about uh, 70, 72 Kelvin. And um, you could argue that with the haze layer, which creates a kind of anti-greenhouse effect, in the absence of the greenhouse effect, the surface temperature would actually be quite a bit lower. So the greenhouse effect is quite important, and the opacity sources are uh, nitrogen, methane, and hydrogen principally. I'll talk about the source of hydrogen in a few minutes. Um, it's different from the Earth's atmosphere in the sense that um, not only are the greenhouse gases different, but the absorption processes are different as well. The dominant absorption uh, process is collision-induced absorption. Uh, nitrogen, of course, is a symmetric molecule, so is molecular hydrogen. And um, even in the absence of methane, the high pressure of nitrogen in this atmosphere, uh, thanks to the frequent collisions, uh, would provide enough opacity to create some sort of greenhouse effect. And I'll get back to that a little bit later on. So the high density, high pressure of this atmosphere is very important in maintaining this temperature profile. And of course, it's because the temperature is above 90 or 91 Kelvin over most of the surface that methane by itself can be a liquid. Um, the presence of other constituents into which methane dissolves ensures that a liquid, in fact, can be present down into temperatures approaching 80 Kelvin, in fact. Um, above the troposphere itself, there is uh, a stratosphere. The temperature rises because of absorption, again, of sunlight in the blue part of the spectrum. Uh, there are various detached haze layers. There's another temperature reversal, uh, several, in fact. Uh, here in the thermosphere is where um, particle radiation is absorbed and very interesting chemistry, uh, not only driven by UV, but also driven by particles from Saturn's magnetosphere. Uh, takes place. The, the other two points I want to make about this atmosphere is that because of the drop in temperature with altitude and the fact that the methane mixing ratio near the surface, 5%, is equivalent to a humidity that's pretty high, 45%, uh, one actually gets clouds of methane not too far above the surface at about 8 kilometers altitude and above. And those clouds have been observed and directly measured during the Huygens descent. The other important point here, and important for exploration as well, is if you look at the scale of this atmosphere, the tropopause uh, is at about 45 kilometers, whereas in the case of the Earth's atmosphere, the temperature minimum, our tropopause, is at about 16 or 18 kilometers, a factor of more than two less. And this is due uh, essentially entirely to Titan's low mass and low gravity. It has a gravity one-sixth that of the of Earth's gravity. So if you just look at the scale height of these atmospheres, which is the temperature uh, divided by uh, the gravity, divided by the mean molecular weight, multiplied by the gas constant, Titan's surface temperature is, is one third that of the Earth's. That would shrink the scale height. But the gravitational acceleration is one sixth that of the Earth. So that immediately gives you a factor of two larger scale height. And of course, the molecular weights are virtually the same, nitrogen and nitrogen. So this is a very extended atmosphere. There is um, a measurable uh, atmospheric density up at 1,000 kilometers or even higher. And that has fundamental implications for exploration. Uh, it means, for example, that the Cassini orbiter is limited to being above 900 or 950 kilometers on its flybys. Uh, that limits the resolution of the radar system. Uh, it limits severely the ability to measure um, or to search for magnetic fields on Titan and to get gravity data. Because you want to be as close to the object you're getting uh, 
you're, you're trying to derive the gravitational moments of, uh, you cannot do that with Titan. And in fact, what is interesting about the gravity experiment on Cassini uh, is that it's been a learning experience for that team, that initially the idea of going as close as possible and being able to remove the noise associated with drag in the atmosphere itself turns out not to work. And uh, the noisiest gravity data are those that come from the closest flybys. And so an optimal distance turns out to be about 1,300 kilometers above the surface at least for the gravity. And of course, you would really like to be closer. Um, but you cannot be. So this limits um, a number of things that one can do at Titan. And that's the other thing. Thanks, Lonnie. Very, yeah, because the other point I wanted to make, too, is that um, that's certainly the case. And the large scale height means that uh, this is a very easy atmosphere to enter. The, the Deceleration loads are very small uh, compared to that of, of the Earth. Um, uh, heating is, is relatively less. It's an easy atmosphere to enter. Uh, that doesn't diminish uh, the technical accomplishment of the Huygens probe mission, uh, but it is the equivalent of the softest pillow at the Holiday Inn versus the firm pillow at the Holiday Inn. So, uh, and it's something that actually people forget, but it's important to remember that if you want to land anywhere in the solar system, other than the great distance from the Earth, this is the easiest place to do it. Now, I apologize that this is in French, but I really liked the colors. It's from somebody's dissertation, and it shows where uh, energy is deposited in Titan's atmosphere. So this is pressure in millibars, temperature in degrees Kelvin, altitude in kilometers. Here's the temperature profile. Titan has an ionosphere, uh, which in fact is interesting because the magnetic field signature of Saturn is mapped uh, uh, onto that ionosphere and was detected by Cassini. But because Titan's orbit around Saturn takes it out of Saturn's magnetosphere sometimes into the solar wind, that um, imprint of Saturn's magnetic field gets erased periodically. And that's been observed as well. And it's kind of like an etch-a-sketch board where you draw these field patterns and then when you go out into the solar wind, you know, it, it gets erased. Uh, so that, again, is, is, a, is a unique uh, kind of, um, of magnetospheric system, uh, magnetic system. Unfortunately, the ionosphere also screens out any weak induced magnetic fields that might be generated below the crust within a, a liquid water layer, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, and so from an orbiter, unless that orbiter can get below the ionosphere, which means getting down to 600 or 500 kilometers, it's very difficult to determine whether there are induced fields. Um, and in fact, the region between about 950 kilometers down to about 300 or 400 kilometers, where there's extensive data from the Sears experiment, uh, has been referred to variously as the ignorosphere or the agnostosphere on Titan, depending on whether you like Latin or Greek. And uh, it's the region that is very, very poorly probed and will be difficult to probe in future missions, uh, in fact. So um, these are just where you see various sources of energy. So cosmic rays make it uh, all the way down to the surface of Titan, but not as well as they do in the case of the Earth. There's a smaller cosmic ray flux at the surface of Titan than on the Earth because the air density on Titan is four times larger than the air density in this room. Um, and then uh, there's near UV radiation that gets down to the stratosphere. Uh, there's a far UV that's deposited much higher up. Uh, magnetospheric electrons get deposited also fairly high up, the 600 to 1,000 kilometer region. And there are a number of uh, different haze layers that one sees, detached haze layers, broader haze layers associated with the absorption of this energy by methane and secondarily by nitrogen, leading to a very active chemistry uh, in the upper atmosphere. When we think about the stratospheric chemistry in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, although uh, ozone chemistry is very complicated with chlorine and, and other catalysts present, uh, the fundamental uh, aspect of that chemistry is it's an oxygen-hydrogen chemistry. You get OH, you get O3, you get O2. Uh, but you don't get the kind of variety uh, that organic chemistry can provide and which is enabled in this part of the atmosphere 
uh, by these various sources of energy. And so this is a horribly old graph from INMS, um, and, uh, but it illustrates my point. This is from the Cassini ion neutral mass spectrometer. Uh, this is a kind of a summary chart with preliminary identifications, and you can go to the papers uh, of uh, Roger Yell's group, more recent papers, and, and see better identifications. But the important point here is that uh, these are numbers versus mass over charge. The limit of the mass spectrometer on board the Cassini orbiter is about 100 AMU. And you see uh, uh, organic polymers all the way out as far as you can to C6, C7, and C8 uh, with not very much decrease, so that presumably if you go farther out, you would see more complex polymers. And in fact, there are other plasma experiments on the Cassini mission that indicate the presence of very heavy polymers with large carbon numbers, but they don't have the mass resolution to identify what those compounds are. So beginning with methane uh, and nitrogen, there is a very rich chemistry that's occurring in the atmosphere. But as far as the implications for the surface, a lot of that chemistry can be encapsulated in um, the, the starting stages of it, which is the production of light hydrocarbons. And uh, I apologize to any chemists in the audience who will probably be insulted by this sort of Fred Flintstone ball and stick model. But here are two methane molecules, uh, UV radiation, short word of about 1,400 angstroms, uh, will break uh, the CH bonds. This is hydrogen, this is carbon. And uh, the product um, uh, most often actually is acetylene, C2H2. Um, sometimes it's ethane. But once acetylene is formed, it then uh, can further uh, be um, uh, photolyzed uh, into radicals uh, at wavelengths up to 2,000 angstroms, where there are plenty of photons, to produce ethane. So, the dominant product of this chemistry is actually ethane, because the stratosphere is where this chemistry is occurring, and the temperatures in the stratosphere are low enough that once ethane is formed, methane is at about 1.5% in the stratosphere. That's the coal trap mixing ratio. Um, once ethane or acetylene are formed, their vapor pressures are so much lower than that of methane that they will very quickly form aerosols uh, and be taken out of the system. So only a small fraction of the hydrocarbons that are generated uh, go on to produce higher hydrocarbons. The hydrogen that's produced uh, is, um, of course, diffuses in both directions, downward and upward. But because Titan's gravity is so low, uh, it's actually mostly lost. And so there is no opportunity uh, to uh, have a chemical cycle where you go back again to methane, at least with the hydrogen that's, that's uh, uh, liberated uh, in the formation of the, the radicals of methane. So uh, this is a one-way street. Um, methane is destroyed, and acetylene and ethane and other hydrocarbons are produced. And because nitrogen is present as well, things like HCN, cyanogens, and so on are also produced in the atmosphere. One of the consequences of this is that there must be some way to uh, supply additional methane from some source in Titan, or possibly outside of Titan, but most likely within Titan. Because uh, if you simply uh, integrate up the amount of methane that's in Titan's atmosphere today, uh, most of it's in the troposphere, um, and then just ask how long it takes to convert that to acetylene and ethane, which are then condensed as aerosols and fall to the surface? The answer is something like 100 million years. All of the methane in Titan's atmosphere today will be gone on a time scale that's equivalent to a few percent of the age of the solar system. And so either we're looking at Titan's last gasp, which nobody likes to contemplate because we're not living in a special time, um, or there is a, a source. And when you look at comets as the source, you quickly convince yourself that there aren't enough of them uh, in the present epoch. And so the source must be somewhere on the surface of Titan, in the crust of Titan, or in the deep interior of Titan. So let's move on to the hydrologic cycle. 
Um, I will just say, uh, and this really is carrying coals to Newcastle, that almost everything we know about Titan is thanks to these two spacecraft, the Cassini orbiter, which was designed, built, uh, controlled from, uh, and guided by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and the Huygens probe, which is the European Space Agency probe. Uh, this was a very complicated mission, probably one of the most complicated to design and execute, both because of the international components and the large number of experiments, uh, over a dozen on the orbiter, depending on how you count them, and six on the Huygens probe. Uh, this spacecraft weighed over 6,200 kilograms on launch, fully fueled. Um, there are no scan platforms. It's basically um, a, a large uh, bus-sized soda can with all the instruments body mounted, and that was to save money during the design and testing phase. But of course, what it did was commit uh, JPL to a very complex mission because the instruments have to point in all sorts of different directions. The radar system, of course, out here, this is the radio antenna, uh, remote sensing pallet, plasma package. Uh, and so the spacecraft is always moving around. And you cannot observe Titan with all the instruments on any given flyby. Of course, this is not a Titan orbiter. This is a Saturn orbiter. So one only visits Titan occasionally. The Huygens probe, um, battery powered, unlike the RTG powered Cassini, had a, a maximum lifetime of two and a half hours in the atmosphere uh, and no guaranteed lifetime on the surface. But ESA kept talking about a few minutes. Uh, it actually transmitted data uh, beyond the time that the orbiter was over the horizon to receive the data. And ground-based uh, radio telescopes detecting the carrier signal from the probe found that it, it lasted three hours on the surface. So <clears throat> the batteries were definitely over-designed, but it was very successful. So <clears throat> the Cassini orbiter mission is still continuing. And everything I'm going to say, uh, with the exception of some important ground-based observations that I'll talk about as well, but pretty much everything else is coming from uh, this mission, which has been crucially important to the history of planetary exploration. So here are the components of the hydrologic cycle on Titan, um, arranged in a sort of a summary fashion from the largest uh, scales clockwise to the smallest scales. And then I'll talk in a little bit more detail about each of these. Um, on the largest scales now, this is a, a, a set of uh, two images from the Cassini Imaging Science Subsystem uh, camera, which, uh, and I don't know if this is the NAC or the WAC, maybe Ralph does, but okay. It's, um, uh, it's CCD cameras that operate out to uh, nearly to a micron and can see the surface uh, at uh, one methane window of 0.95 microns. Uh, of course, the haze, uh, the, the, the shorter the wavelength you look, because this haze is composed of very small particles, micron, submicron size, uh, the optical is more severely affected than the near-infrared. However, when you get into the near-infrared, uh, you immediately uh, run into these massive absorption bands of methane, because there is so much methane in this atmosphere that these bands are, are really broadened out. And you'll see in a few slides how much that affects the ability to get spectra of Titan's surface with the near-infrared mapping spectrometer. But these are images at 0.95 microns, 2004 when Cassini arrived, 2005. The South Pole is somewhere in here. An important lake, uh, Ontario Lacus, that we'll talk about later is, is here at the bottom. And uh, these are convective clouds. Uh, they, they really have the morphology of clouds that form by convection. Uh, Cassini arrived uh, during southern summer at a time when it was predicted that there should be uh, the formation of convective clouds, uh, clouds made of methane, of course. And these clouds were seen uh, to actually, um, in time lapse uh, uh, from one flyby to another, to move away from the south polar region. Uh, and what's interesting is that as they moved away, it looked like there were more dark spots and uh, more sharply delineated dark spots underneath where these clouds had been, the implication being that uh, this uh, rain out of methane led to large pools, large areas, because this is 1,000 kilometers in extent here, 
where <coughs> the methane was at least in a transient way flooding the surface. Now, when radar came along several years later and imaged this part of the South Polar region, uh, there were uh, essentially only two or three recognizable lakes. Uh, the rest of the surface looked quite dry. On the other hand, methane is so transparent to radar at two centimeters that if there were some very shallow ponded areas of methane, you wouldn't see them with the radar. But this is active, uh, this is weather going on, uh, and it's weather involving, uh, as far as one can tell, methane. Now, on a, a scale that's 10 times more detailed, 100 kilometers across here, this is a portion of two radar strips from now the northern hemisphere, which at the time was in the dark and is now just coming into sunlight uh, in the North Polar region, uh, thanks to uh, the change of seasons. And this is one of these, nor a portion of one of these northern lakes seen at 350 meter resolution. Uh, you can see fluvial features, areas where channels have been incised. These very dark areas really are black. They are returning no radar signal, uh, at least above the noise floor. And of course, it's consistent with the fact that the Cassini radar operating in imaging mode uh, operates not as a nadir-looking device, but as a side-looking device. And so any smooth surface uh, is not going to return any radio energy back to the antenna uh, if the beam is being sent out sideways. So uh, this image, which is essentially constructed like a synthetic aperture radar, uh, hints at these areas being liquid, and every other property uh, of these, including what's happening at the boundary with the brighter areas, uh, the, the two uh, centimeter radiometry, the, the radar can be used uh, in a radiometry or passive mode, uh, the altimetry and scatterometry over the southern lake, Ontarius, again with the radar, um, and the detection of ethane itself, a liquid under tightened conditions in the southern hemisphere. All these things point to these very black areas uh, as being liquid. And actually, most recently, over one of these large northern lakes, the VIMS instrument, the Near Infrared Imager Spectrometer, actually caught a glint of sunlight uh, off of an area near uh, to one of these lakes. So um, in every way, although we cannot dip our feet into this at the moment, uh, these really appear to be bodies of liquid. And if they are, they are vast. In fact, in a paper uh, headed up by Ralph Lorenz calculating the amount of uh, methane and ethane that would be in these lakes, uh, this would exceed the amount of fossil fuel, known fossil fuel reserves on the Earth by one or two orders of magnitude. Uh, <clears throat> and therefore is the next stop for BP Petroleum after they clean things up in the Gulf. Uh, so now going down another two orders of magnitude, uh, this is an, an image from the camera, the DISR camera, uh, during the descent of the Huygens probe. Uh, this is on the Huygens probe. Uh, this camera system was designed uh, and headed up by Marty Tomasco at the University of Arizona. Uh, it was very successful, very difficult imaging. I'll talk about that later. These uh, dendritic features, which branch uh, to third and in some cases maybe fourth order, uh, have a width on the order of 10 meters. And um, this image is, is very highly compressed, of course, so it has an odd appearance to it but these are evidently dendritic features. And in fact, this area that the probe drifted over was imaged uh, sufficiently that stereo could be constructed from those images. And the slopes here are 30 or 40 degrees. And the topography is such that um, the dendritic features uh, are indeed uh, going the right way toward delivering liquid toward this area, this flat plain, which is a few hundred meters below the highest point here, about half a kilometer below the highest point. And then finally, at the Huygens landing site itself, disser images, these are two of the disser images. This is now 10 centimeters. Uh, these pebbles are between a few and 10 centimeters across. This is a lamp that was turned on to make white light spectra in the very red light, ambient light of the, the Titan environment. Um, but um, these are very, very rounded, and uh, they're not at all consistent with uh, volcanic or something that's been chipped off by impact. Uh, and in fact, in these two images, you can see the appearance of this little feature in the lower left, which is on the Huygens probe itself. 
and is consistent, as Eric Karkovska of the Disser team has argued, is consistent with formation of a methane dewdrop on the edge of the probe. We'll get back to that later. So um, clouds, rain, rivers, lakes, um, rounded pebbles. Yeah? They're separated in time. So this is um, shortly after landing, and this is sometime thereafter. Once the probe landed, it was just uh, the the programming was just to keep taking pictures, and then look for change. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Is there another image that showed the dew drop in another location? No. No, and Eric does the statistics of, well, if you see one drop in 160 frames taken at this rate, then there's basically between one drop a minute and one every five seconds or something. But can one calculate the However, as I'll say in a few minutes, we have other direct measurements of methane actually outgassing from below the probe itself, which is, which is methane because it comes from mass spectrometry data. So, uh, and this little dewdrop is presumably part of that outgassing. Okay, so another way to look at the Huygens images uh, is to put them all together um, into a kind of a composite view and this was done by Larry Sutterblum and colleagues at the USGS, part of the DISSER team. Yeah. Oh, we don't know anything. In fact, one of the frustrations is that the, um, there were spectra of the immediate area where the probe landed, beginning at a few hundred meters above the surface. And um, there, there are hints of water ice absorption features, but the overall spectral slope doesn't really fit uh, anything that um, has been, it doesn't fit tholins, which would be more orange. And there aren't any other distinct spectral features. And so it's a very relatively featureless spectrum out to 1.5 microns with some hints of water ice and then something else that is presumably coating the surface or is coating the pebbles. No evidence for ammonia. Pardon? No evidence for ammonia. No evidence for ammonia. No. So those pebbles are probably, almost certainly they're water ice that um, might be coated with organic material. Um, who knows how long they've been sitting there, but um, they presumably have been tumbled down from the hill behind the landing site. And in fact, um, in another paper, Soderblom and colleagues uh, actually, from whatever stereo is available, make an argument that debris coming from here is going to eventually make it, if liquid is flowing outward, is going to make it to the Huygens landing site, which is somewhere over here. Well, this hill is presumably water ice. And in fact, the whole bedrock of Titan is presumably water ice. And so it, it's, the equivalent of, it's the equivalent of liquid water carving out rock uh, and taking the rock, the little pebbles, and having them tumble down the hill. So, um, so in fact, that does bring me to this image. This, this hill, this topographic feature, which at least from the bottom up to here is a few hundred meters in height, although there's no spectroscopic data, is almost certainly water ice. Um, again, you take the density of Titan, uh, the observation of abundant water ice in the outer solar system. So that density is, is um, consistent with a roughly 50-50 mix of rock and ice. Um, Titan is not fully differentiated, but is at least partly differentiated, um, maybe nearly fully. So the ice is going to be on the outside. So the crust of Titan is almost certainly water ice one. And there are ground-based observations at five microns showing water ice absorption features in the global spectrum of Titan, although very weak, 
much weaker than Ganymede, much weaker than Callisto, which says that there uh, is water ice exposed on Titan, but much of it is, is, is covered or coated, that there are only some exposures of clean water ice uh, poking through what is presumably a blanket of organic material uh, that has been produced in the upper atmosphere from the photochemistry of methane. And in fact, in the background, these two linear strips are seen in radar data as part of a vast, uh, literally seas, if you will, of dunes, of dune fields. And those dunes, based on near-infrared observations, really colors, and the radiometry from the radar system at two centimeters, those dunes are composed of particles that are either solid organics or are coated with solid organics. And so there are blankets of this material stretching over thousands of kilometers of Titan's surface. And there are color variations in the near infrared, again, very few actual absorption features, showing that much of this dark material, or suggesting that much of this dark material, is also solid organic. Um, and then whether this is exposed water ice or not, uh, is there, there, are no, there, there are no spectra there that are good enough to indicate. Uh, there is certainly water ice here, though, because the slopes in this region, and I'll zoom in on this, the slopes that have been measured from the stereo imagery in here are, are 30 and 40 degrees. And so the only material that's strong enough to do that over geologic time is either rock or it's water. And, and again, because of the way that planets differentiate, the water is going to be on the outside. So the, the steep slopes here argue that this hill is part of the bedrock of Titan and that it is water ice. But that's the most that we know. And one of the frustrations about Titan is it's very difficult to get real compositional data on crustal materials because the atmosphere is so dense uh, and so uh, uh, blocked by methane absorption features. Uh, one really needs to go and sample directly, and that's been done partially, and you'll see that in a minute, um, uh, or float around and be able to take a spectrometer below the haze and examine these features uh, in, uh, in great detail. Um, okay, so this area, there are fractures uh, to the east of the dendritic features. There are fractures where it looks like a liquid has ponded up, a weld in some way, and into what Soderblom and colleagues have called beaver ponds. I don't think there are beavers on Titan. Um, uh, but ag again, what you're looking at is probably is an outcropping of water ice a few hundred meters high, uh, exposed above a general terrain of uh, solid, maybe even some liquid organics here, uh, and then these organic dunes in the background. So really quite exotic. I'm not aware that anyone's done that analysis, actually. Part of the problem is this image is really heavily compressed. And so you see that, for example, you actually lose um, the, the linearity of these features in here. And uh, you get you know, the albedo feature sort of fades in and out. So, uh, and this is the only image of that fracture system that we actually have. Um, by the way, this is, this is on the order. These are like 10 meters or so, but they're not really well resolved here. So, we're talking about maybe a kilometer across. Uh, but I'm not aware anyone's done that with this image. Interesting question. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, so Jay's point is a good one, actually. Um, if, I, if I again take this rate of conversion of methane to higher hydrocarbons, um, and um, I take the, just the solid hydrocarbon component, because the ethane is the dominant product, but it's liquid. Uh, the acetylene is supposed to be acetylene and HCN, the dominant solid products. It's about 100, if, if this has gone on continuously, if you average over the whole surface of Titan, you get a blanket of about 100 meters depth 
of solid organic debris over the age of the solar system, four and a half billion years. So, uh, to, so that's 100 meters. To bury these pebbles, uh, you would only need um, a few centimeters, let's say 10 centimeters or so, right? So we're talking about a factor of 1,000. Um, and so now we're talking about um, a, a, you know, a few million years, essentially. So what this is at least telling you, the fact that these pebbles are exposed, is that this area has been uh, worked over in the last few million years. And you know, maybe more recently than that, certainly. But, but that's the limit you get. Yes. But it's not, it's not exactly solid, and, and potentially winds could blow it away from this area. They could? Right, although the, the dunes themselves, because they are dunes and not simply uniform blanket, require that this material actually be agglomerated into centimeter-sized particles. So that's, it's a long way from, it's a long way from micron-sized particles to things that are millimeters to centimeters. So there is some process that is agglomerating this material, presumably after it's, it's reached the surface, into particles that will behave like dune material, because if they stay really small, then the winds on Titan, which are on the order of a meter or so, are just going to create uniform blankets. They're not going to create dune fields. So there is an agglomeration process for a fraction of the, of the aerosol product, not necessarily for all of it. But your, your point that material is going to be moved around from one place to another is, is certainly true. Um, I'm going to show a little later a, a radar image that suggests that some craters in some places have been buried by, by some material, that they have been blanketed to the point where you only see the outline of the crater and not the whole thing. So let's see. Yes, Lonnie first. I think the veneer is pretty involatile at 94 Kelvin. I mean, we're, the, the veneer is going to be the heavier hydrocarbons that have a really low vapor pressure at this temperature of 94. Even acetylene has pretty low vapor pressure. I'll show that a little bit later, too. Yes? The question okay. about these reaction products, uh, do they actually dissolve in the liquid methane? I'll get to that. I will later on, I promise. I have a chart. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes. So here's a desert, here's somebody's backyard in Tucson. The broom weed is not present on Titan, but um, the, you know, these, I mean, these look really similar. Now these have been tumbled out of the Catalina Mountains behind this particular backyard. Um, of course, they're rock. So now ask me your question again about this terrestrial case. Because, I mean, we've got all these interesting questions about the thing that I know the least about, which is <laughs> geomorphology and rocks, even though I got my degree from here. People will tell you I was crawling on my hands and knees during the first geological field trips until I finally figured out how to walk. Yes, what was your question? So my question was that I, in these desert environments, you sometimes find rocks that clearly weren't deposited there by fluvial transport or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was 
Well, I don't understand the process you're describing, so it's hard for me to evaluate that. When you say, I mean, there are only two things, three things that are produced in any abundance in the upper atmosphere that are liquid on Titan, methane, ethane, and propane. The rest is pretty much all solid, okay? There's, there's heptane also. So um, presumably, this area in the past had liquid on it, liquid methane, and I'll, I'll give you the argument for that in a minute. Um, so now, you know, it, it doesn't have methane there now, and maybe it's been drying up progressively in the last few tens of millions of years, hundred million years, as the methane's, the last episode of methane outgassing has now subsided and the methane's being used up. So now, what happens to the rocks as that methane evaporates away? What, why are these exposed then? I'm trying to understand the process. Yes, right. And you shook them, then the, some would go up. But how do you shake these? Right. Well, that, that, my question is, is there any hypothesized mechanism that could possibly account for that taking place, where those generate from below and not above? I haven't read any in the literature. Um, so I, you know, I haven't come across any. Whether That doesn't mean there aren't any. But all of the literature interpretations of this scene have been fluvial deposition. That doesn't mean that it's not. Sarah. Okay. It, it's not clear how you would make that in this, in this situation. I mean, part of the problem is we don't know what the properties of this, we don't know what the composition is of these pebbles, and we also don't know what the composition of the background soil is. We only know, and this is what I'm going to get to in a minute, that there's actually methane and ethane in this soil itself, okay? This is solid, it's solid something with a blue slope to it, but it's got methane and ethane in it. So that's as much as we know. That's why we're having this workshop, is to figure out ways to do a better job. So Ralph is gonna uh, talk uh, about the Huygens probe, so I'm not gonna talk very much about it, only to motivate this particular set of observations, which I think are really important. Um, the bottom of the Huygens probe had various inlets uh, on it, including a GCMS inlet with a heated needle. And, um, of course, this thing came down um, at a speed of, um, was it a meter, couple of meters per second? Well, five meters a second. Uh, so this ended up in the soil. Actually, it, it may have slid and actually broken this particular pebble. That's one possibility. Uh, the, the, the accelerometer suggests that that happened. And there are two interesting observations. One that I hope Ralph will talk about, which is the temperature history of that heated probe after landing. This is time from the start of the experiment. Here's the impact. Here's the temperature of that, that needle, which had a, a, a current applied to it. So it was a controlled experiment. And the ultimate temperature that it reaches is consistent not with a very dry, powdery soil, but with something that had either a vapor flowing through it or something evaporating at the time, uh, it's a lower temperature than what you would get for the powdery soil. At the same time, the GCMS itself actually measured the abundances of various constituents. And this, again, is time in the same units. Uh, here's the impact time. And uh, these are counts per second for nitrogen on the left, for methane on the right. This is a mass spectrometer. The GC part, the gas chromatograph, did not work, so there are no GC data. And uh, this is nitrogen, and this is methane in the atmosphere, and then after impact, the methane signature goes up substantially and remains high uh, while the probe is sitting on the surface until uh, the data taking ends. And so evidently, methane has, um, uh, evaporated from this soil and is present inside this soil. But the curious thing is, it's not only methane, it's several other things, some of which you would expect and others you don't. Um, this is now a different way to display the data. This is a, 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 a mass spectrum, a spectrogram, counts per second versus mass over charge. Uh, a number of these averaged within the 10 to 20 kilometer region of the probe's descent. There are also 
data all the way up to 160 kilometers. And as you might expect, at, at 10 kilometers, the temperature is, is, is 85, uh, let's see, it's 1.6 degrees to 16. Yeah, about 80, 80 Kelvin. Um, and uh, at, at 20 kilometers, a bit more below that. Uh, most of the constituents that are, uh, that you would expect to be in the atmosphere are basically frozen out. So you only see methane, hydrogen, nitrogen, 40 argon. CO2 is a little bit odd because um, the vapor pressure is such that you really shouldn't see it, but the signature is quite weak. And then after impact, after landing, this is um, an average of a number of surface uh, spectra from the mass spectrograph. Counts per second, mass over charge. The hydrogen hasn't changed. The methane to nitrogen ratio has gone up, as in the previous graph. You also see um, ethane present. Uh, the 40 argon has not changed. Well, it's gone up a bit, actually. Uh, the CO2 has gone up a bit. And uh, cyanogen and benzene are showing up now. So there's this sort of weird hodgepodge of things that appear uh, in the data after landing. Now, you might worry that some of this was somehow s stuff that was stuck in the, in the mass, uh, in, in the, the inlet or other parts of the GCMS, and are somehow now coming out after impact. But the ethane and, and the methane in particular seem pretty compelling, uh, maybe even the benzene and the cyanogen. And so maybe this is a crude indication of what is on and in that surface that the Huygens probe uh, was resting on during the time that these spectra were taken. And certainly, uh, one can imagine, because their volatility, if methane and ethane are in the ground, that they would be sublimated through this heated needle, or evaporated, I should say, and would be coming out outgassing. And then, of course, the presence of this little droplet on the camera baffle is supporting evidence that that, in fact, is what's happening. Oh, dead. It, it's, well, yeah, yeah, there is no, there, yeah, there's, that's right. I mean, you would expect that, you know, right below the probe, at least, that there should be some transient, and uh, there isn't. So it may have to do with averaging as the stuff leaks into the pipe, um, that you're really not able to see that initial transient. You just see the methane that's working its way through the system, through the pumps. Uh, but it is certainly striking that this stays at this very constant high level for um, you know, a long period of time. So, so anyway, that's as much as we know. Um, but how, how did the temperature of the probe match that of the atmosphere? I'm going to leave that to Ralph. Actually, do you want to answer that now or during your talk? One more question, I'm going to move on to the fun stuff, because this is just the Huygens probe. The fun stuff is the lakes. Go ahead. If only we knew it was really there, so we could determine how well the Huygens probe actually measured what was in the system. Let me move on to the, the orbiter discoveries, um, which I think are, are even more dramatic. And of course, beginning in 2007, the radar system, which looks at strips across the surface uh, with a minimum uh, thickness uh, w uh, up and down of, um, on the order of 100, 200 kilometers, began to see in the northern hemisphere, and not in color, because it's a single wavelength radar, so I apologize for this, 
um, began to see these very black areas that had a wide variety of different morphologies and a wide variety of sizes, hundreds of lakes in the northern hemisphere, uh, northern hemisphere polar region above 60 degrees latitude, a few lakes in the equivalent for the southern hemisphere. Um, but these are evidently an important part of the hydrologic cycle. And Alex Hayes, who's a graduate student who's here, uh, working with Odette Aronson, uh, who's on the Caltech faculty here, has mapped these lakes and in a paper showed that there are different morphologies. There are very dark lakes that appear to be filled with liquid. Um, there are bright lakes that are like the background uh, in the north in particular and look like they're simply empty uh, lakes that are, are existing basins, but they're empty of liquid. And then there are these somewhat more puzzling granular lakes. I'm not going to talk about the details of that. This map gives you a sense of the size. Here's Lake Michigan on the Earth. But evidently, there are processes going on that are emptying and presumably also refilling lakes. Uh, and um, there is a handle on the depth of these lakes because, again, both methane and ethane um, are very poor absorbers of uh, radio uh, waves at two centimeter wavelength, and there are brightness variations in parts of the lake, so one can get some constraints on depth, at least on minimum depth in the darkest regions. And of course, one of the key issues for Cassini, uh, and this is again from Alex's paper, is the question of whether these hydrocarbon lakes are isolated, and in fact, some of them look like they're just kind of perched uh, in, in calderas or whether they're part of an overall system in the northern hemisphere that includes a large body of methane and maybe ethane in the crust itself, um, which has been an idea that's been around for quite some time. Uh, the morphologies of these uh, are, are beautiful. Um, this is Ligea mare. Uh, you can see some of the um, uh, uh, fluvial features associated with the edges of this in this uh, set of several radar images. Um, an, an amateur um, planetary scientist, a map maker, Peter Minton, made a beautiful uh, map of this from the radar data, which illustrates, I think, better some of the little islands and uh, dendritic features around here. And in addition to these lakes and seas, um, there are radar images of fluvial features. But uh, these fluvial features are really quite sparse. Uh, you know, compared to some of the other things we see on Titan, you don't see very much in the way of fluvial erosion. There are some places. This is in the southern hemisphere at moderate to high latitudes. Uh, here's the scale of the overall image. But it's important to bear in mind a very important point, which is that the resolution of the radar is only 350 uh, meters. Uh, and that's not. Uh, a very high resolution for looking at flu fluvial features. Uh, in fact, here's another area, 110 by 80 kilometers, and you can sort of see some fluvial features here in this beautiful suggestion of a lake, but it's not clear what's going on here. And in fact, I have to tell you, this isn't a radar image of Titan, it's a radar image of Rome, and that's the real resolution, uh, which is 20 meters. And at 20 meters, you see all of this intricate uh, fluvial erosion that's going on here. Here's the, the Tiber River uh, going down through Rome. In here, here's the International Airport. Uh, here's a volcanic complex, the Colle Albani, with actually two lakes, both of which have liquid in them. But it was evidently a windy day, so you don't see um, the liquid there in, in Lago Albano. And the Mediterranean, which doesn't look dark at all. But the important point is that um, if you look at this with a 350 meter resolution degraded to that, you just lose all of that. And uh, you know, this is not very scientific, but the Huygens probe was dropped on a place on Titan that was determined entirely for engineering reasons, uh, reasons of the orbiter trajectory, the ability to get signals back having proper lighting for the imaging. And when you put all that together, you get two tiny little boxes near the equator uh, where the Huygens probe could be deployed. And you know, even with that purely engineering decision, it gets these beautiful pictures of dendritic channels that would be completely invisible to the Cassini radar. So what are, what are the chances that that's the one place where there are these small dendritic features? Uh, I think the chances of that are pretty small. 
So if one could go back to Titan with 20 meter resolution, is this the kind of thing that you would see? Uh, finally, to close on uh, the hydrologic cycle, uh, the methane hydrologic cycle, one has to include the dune fields. These are some radar images of dunes. Actually, here's one image. This is blown up here. Uh, these dunes appear to be longitudinal dunes. Uh, they have all sorts of interesting shapes. You can track them moving around obstructions. There are some inconsistencies between the morphological inference that these are uh, longitudinal dunes and the fact that they go east-west and that's the general direction of the winds and the specific kinds of winds that are predicted by global circulation models. In order to get dunes like this, you generally need a kind of a fluctuating bi-directional flow. That's not really showing up in the general circulation models and uh, that has not been really well resolved. Now Huygens itself sampled the winds um, uh, it's known from ground-based observations that uh, Titan has a super-rotating atmosphere at high altitude. In the lower altitudes, it's meters per second, uh, and uh, with uh, perhaps at the poles a number more typically of less than a meter per second. Here's the microwave radiometry data, two centimeters, brightness temperature shown here in degrees Kelvin. Uh, which argue for the dune fields being made of something other than water ice, ammonia ice, or silicates. This is brightness temperature versus viewing angle. These temperatures in the areas of the dunes are in the upper 80s, and uh, for the given viewing angle with the radar, that uh, is really consistent only with hydrocarbons or maybe a mixture of water ice and hydrocarbons, not with ammonia ice and not with pure water ice. So, um, this is part of the inventory of organics um, that are present uh, on Titan. So, um, in fact, this is the inventory. Uh, this is from a, the paper by Ralph Lorenz and colleagues by a number of us. I've redone it artistically. The background area is the amount of methane that's consumed, has been consumed over Titan's history. The, um, uh, the orange here is the amount of methane in the atmosphere today. Um, the amount of methane, equivalent of methane now in, in any kind of organics, uh, in the dunes is shown, this is the lower limit, the white, and the upper limit enclosed here in the gray. And in the lakes and seas, again, a sort of a lower estimate and an upper estimate, but this could be much larger if the lakes and seas that are observed are part of some kind of a, an aquifer system, the equivalent of an aquifer system. And again, because of the limit of resolution with the radar and the VIMS instrument, the near-infrared mapper, uh, we really have no, no constraint on the extent of the fluvial systems and the amount of liquid that gets fluxed through those systems in, in steady state. The cycle itself is very different from that on the Earth because we lack a, here on Titan, we lack um, an ocean. Uh, the standing bodies of liquid are restricted to the high latitudes, to the polar regions. Uh, another distinction from that of the Earth is that the temperature drop from the surface to the tropopause is uh, weak enough, the gradient is weak enough, that instead of the amount of methane dropping by a factor of 1,000, from the surface to the tropopause, and as is the case for water on the Earth, it drops by a factor of just three. And so methane is in rapid escape to the upper atmosphere where it gets photolyzed and converted to other constituents, and that's a fundamental difference from that of the Earth. And then there, are, there is some evidence from measurements of, of the electric fields in Titan's atmosphere during the descent of the Huygens probe for the presence of a subcrustal water ocean. Uh, it's a somewhat involved argument, and I'm happy to discuss it during the uh, discussion part, but I don't want to slow things down here. So that's the hydrologic cycle. Let me talk now about a few elements of it. Um, let me talk about seasonal changes. The other interesting correspondence with the Earth is that Titan has an axial tilt close to that of the Earth, 27 degrees. It's actually the axial tilt of Saturn. The two are nearly co-aligned. The other striking thing about um, Saturn's orbit around the sun is that it is significantly eccentric. Uh, so one has a, um, an aphelion of 10 AU, a perihelion of about 9 AU, 
And of course, Titan being carried around the sun with Saturn uh, is uh, in the same eccentric orbit. So we'll get back to that in a minute. From the point of view of seasons, though, the orbital period around the sun is 30 years, 29.5 years. So uh, each season is almost 30 times longer than the seasons on the Earth. This is excruciating for observations of seasonal change. Uh, Cassini arrived uh, here in July of 2004. This is a graph, by the way, put together originally by Ralph Lorenz, I think. Um, but uh, is that right? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember this has a history to it. OK. Um, so here's Cassini's arrival. Now, uh, these uh, all refer to the northern hemisphere. So winter solstice in the north occurred in October of 2002. Cassini arrived about two years later, essentially now during early summer in the southern hemisphere, which is where you get all of the lit images and the spectra. Um, the end of the nominal Cassini mission was here. A first extended mission brought Cassini to vernal equinox in the north, where now the, the vast northern hemisphere lakes and seas that have all been imaged essentially by radar with some very kind of low signal images by ISS and VIMS are now coming into sunlight. And the uh, Cassini mission has been extended now all the way out to summer solstice in the north in May of 2017. So one of the important questions is how do these lakes vary seasonally? Does methane get exchanged from one pole to the other, as first proposed by Potter and Stevenson in 1986, or do other things go on? Now, there is good evidence, as shown in a, a paper actually by, um, by Alex Hayes and, and, and a, a number of us, uh, by looking at ISS images from 2004, 2005, and a recent radar image in 2008, that uh, in fact Ontario Lacus, the big southern hemisphere lake, about 270 kilometers uh, uh, in its uh, long axis, has shrunk over four years. Now you might say, well, this is just an effect of looking with different instruments, uh, optical versus radar, but Alex has made some good arguments based on the topography in this area, which has been obtained by the radar through altimetry profiles surrounding the lake. Uh, these are very exaggerated, by the way. The y-axis is meters, the x-axis is kilometers. The slopes are very gentle. And if you look at where the lake has shrunk and where you have the steepest topography versus the shallowest topography, the sense of the shrinkage is, oh yes, that's my uh, alarm telling me to move along here. Um, the sense of the shrinkage uh, is consistent with this being a real withdrawal of liquid from a basin that has this kind of topography associated with it. And actually, very recently, some ISS camera images uh, taken this year show the same kind of shrinkage. So Ontario Lacus has become smaller over the last four or five years which, remember, is um, a, a portion of a season. It's a portion of the southern summer season on Titan. If you take this topography, as Alex has done, you calculate the loss of the liquid being about 100 uh, cubic kilometers. This is the equivalent of the loss of about a meter per Earth year over the last few years. And this, in turn, is consistent with evaporation of methane driven not by vapor pressure, because the methane vapor pressure is so high that it, the, the evaporation rate is actually energy limited. So you have to then just ask, given the amount of sunlight per square meter per second, um, what evaporation can you get for that amount of energy over a period of several years? And it's consistent with this. So methane is evaporating from this lake. At the same time, however, one doesn't see methane spectroscopically in the lake, because the atmosphere is so full of methane that the methane features are all blocked out. Uh, these are some uh, VIM spectra, actually normalized and subtracted. Brown et al., Brown, uh, Bob Brown is the team leader for the VIMS instrument. It's a near-infrared mapping spectrometer, goes out to five microns. The only regions where you can see the surface are shown with these gray bars. And that, the rest of this is all atmospheric. And that shows you the problem. 
Okay? Nonetheless, there's a feature here uh, that is associated with the lake if you subtract off the shore, and another feature that might be here, both of which are consistent with ethane. And again, ethane is the dominant photochemical product of methane. It's a liquid under tight conditions. It's fully soluble in methane. It actually acts to depress the freezing point, so it should be there. So there's ethane, and would the ethane be evaporating? Well, the problem now is that the vapor pressure of ethane, here's vapor pressure in bars versus temperature. I'm sorry for the weird Excel round off here. But you see the point, this is in logarithmic scale. So we're talking about three or four orders of magnitude lower vapor pressure actually here uh, in the relevant region for the lake temperature. Um, if there were only ethane, Yes, it could evaporate to an extent that it would also result in, in a similar drop. But with the presence of methane, uh, all of the energy gets taken away by the methane. And in fact, for ethane to do this, you need some very stiff winds to remove that vapor and prevent it from raining back on the lake. So the most consistent interpretation of these data are that the lake is evaporating, it's methane that's evaporating from a mixed methane-ethane lake which is just what you would predict from the photochemical models. No, I said if you had a very stiff wind that could really remove all of that ethane wet air. So that, that's an important point, that the vapor pressure for ethane is so low that the air above that lake is saturated with ethane. And so if it were still, it would just rain back out again. So you've got to have very stiff advection, probably more than what one has with winds that are predicted in, in the models. So the evaporation, the shrinkage tells you there's methane, the spectra tell you there's ethane. And that's the important point. Now, that represents the fact that during the summer, it's a more ethane-rich lake. Yeah, I'll get to that. OK. I'm going to skip over those clouds. Now, on longer time scales, um, there may be transport of ethane from one pole to the other. Uh, this is work uh, led by Oded that was published in Nature Geoscience in November. Uh, it starts from the observation that there are lots of lakes in the northern polar region and very few lakes in the southern polar region. And this is not simply an effect of coverage. Uh, if you look at the um, fractional area sample by the radar, which is over here, and the fractional lake area over here, there are very few lakes in the south. Lots of lakes in the north, but the coverage is really quite similar. So this is not an observational effect. Um, but what Oded noticed, uh, actually, and this was also noticed by a number of other people, uh, Emily Schaller, for example, has pointed this out too, uh, is that Saturn's orbit is eccentric. Now, when you uh, take account of that eccentricity and the fact that that orbit is precessing, uh, and uh, there are a few other uh, effects as well on the orbit, you come up with cycles that are kind of somewhat like Milankovitch cycles, uh, which are shown here. This is um, uh, a plot from the paper. This is uh, expressed as the peak difference in insulation from the north to the south in watts per meter squared versus time before present in thousands of years. This is a million years, 400,000 years, et cetera. At present, we're at a point where the south is getting the most intense uh, insulation uh, that it has received uh, essentially in the last really couple hundred thousand years. Uh, now, it's very important to, to note that effects like this don't refer to the amount of sunlight that one gets over um, a, a year. Uh, because again, um, when you're in uh, a, a situation where the south uh, is in summer solstice when uh, the object is at perihelion, that object is moving through perihelion very quickly. So you're moving through that point quickly. And so the amount of sunlight that's received in the summer in the south is the same as the amount that you receive in the north in its summertime, but the heating, uh, the, the, the insulation is more intense. The peak uh, flux in watts per meter squared is higher in the south by a significant amount. Now, is that going to lead then over a long period of time to evaporation of enough lakes that one can potentially explain the um, difference?
between the north and the south in terms of the abundance of lakes. And that's still an open issue because it requires a numerical model. Um, the one thing that you can say is that if you put um, that extra intensity of insulation uh, in, by some process into extra evaporation, that uh, ethane, and for that matter, propane, which may be present in the lake, um, that these will evaporate away um, during the time that the southern hemisphere is receiving um, this higher intensity insulation than the north, that is over half of one of these uh, Milankovitch cycles or quasi-Milankovitch cycles. Um, so again, vapor pressure versus temperature. So it's possible that we're seeing um, an effect of climate that is on a scale of tens of thousands of years that's emptying the southern hemisphere lakes uh, and maintaining the northern hemisphere lakes, but maybe not. Now, this is uh, what this, and there's your paper in 30 seconds, so, all right, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's worse than a DPS talk, right? It's like two minutes, so. All right, but that leads to lots of, both of these cycles, the annual cycle and the Milankovitch cycle, because there are multiple components in this hydrologic system, lead to all sorts of potentially weird effects. If we think about the annual cycles, going from methane-rich lakes to more ethane-propane-rich lakes, Ralph Lorentz and colleagues in a very recent paper pointed out that the viscosity of methane is less than that of water. The viscosity of ethane and propane are greater than that of water. Water is not a magic number, but it just illustrates that ethane and propane have a significantly higher viscosity than methane does, which means that at the end of the summer, the southern hemisphere, the, the summer lake at the end of the summer, be it in the north or the south, has a much higher viscosity than it did at the end of the winter time. And so there may be fewer waves, among other things. And in fact, one of the peculiarities of Ontario Lacus in the south is it really seems very smooth. I mean, it, it, it has a, a smoothness that says there are no waves uh, of any significant size, centimeter scale. And Lorenz and colleagues concluded that this could be explained if the composition of the lake were such that the viscosity is like that of ethane and propane. Uh, so there may be this kind of cycling in material properties which has no analog on the Earth at all. Um, on the Milankovitch time scales, one may be cycling between lakes that are liquid, perhaps on average ethane propane rich, versus dry lake beds that just have precipitates in them. Uh, very low volatility things. Uh, and so this is the equivalent of hydration dehydration cycles, uh, which may lead to some very interesting <coughs> organic chemistry, which nobody has yet explored. Um, uh, there is strong evidence for a kind of chemistry on the surface where acetylene is being converted to benzene. That's actually pretty simple to do, and, and there's spectroscopic evidence for benzene away from the lakes but this kind of progressive cycling uh, back and forth between uh, very involatile solid precipitates uh, and ethane propane rich is something uh, that, uh, that should in fact be pursued. And again, has, has some analog on the earth, yes. Well, I think the, at the time, okay, so let me, let me try an answer and then Ralph can try an answer. Okay, so the radar observations were in 2008, 2009, at a time when this lake had shrunk significantly, and it may be that by that point it was dominated by ethane and propane. If we had seen this lake in radar in 2004, and we had actually been able to do altimetry or scatterometry, would we have seen waves on that lake would it have had more of a behavior typical of the viscosity of methane. We don't have radar data from that time. We don't know. I mean, it could be 10. Could be. That's true. That's true. Yes. You, do you want to take a crack at this, too? Yeah. I mean,
Right. How hard are you? Hard are you, you know, there's, there's at least to be a lot more quantitative work on, on wave generation physics, frankly. You had a question. Do you have a question? No. No, you're right. It's not. How about that? It's something else. Look at that. All right. Just X that out. I'll get to benzene in a minute. Um, changes over geologic time. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the longest term changes are, um, in the atmosphere at least, are going to have something to do with the depletion of methane. And an interesting question is that, um, as I'll argue in a few minutes, if methane is depleted from time to time in the atmosphere, what actually happens to the atmosphere? Um, this is a chart of the collision-induced absorption uh, in um, a mixed nitrogen, argon, hydrogen, and methane system. And you can ignore the, the argon, it, it doesn't play a role, and in the case of Titan, the argon is, is much smaller than this number, uh, versus wave number in centimeters. Now, uh, if you actually look at the peak of the Planck function for um, Titan today, uh, it's uh, the peak of the, the thermal spectrum, if it were a black body, is here. Um, the radiative balance of the atmosphere tends to be affected by opacities that uh, act at the peak of the Planck function and longer wavelength or lower wave numbers. So I'm suggesting that here. And so it is dominated today by nitrogen methane. Now, what happens if that methane goes away? Well, the atmosphere doesn't necessarily collapse because as the atmosphere cools, that Planck function shifts over. And what's interesting is that it runs into um, a rapidly increasing opacity uh, associated with nitrogen-nitrogen collisions. I mean, nitrogen is not spectroscopically active, but the pressure is so high, the density is so high, that the collision-induced absorption in the atmosphere is significant. So there's something of a barrier here beyond which the atmosphere is sustained, even by nitrogen-nitrogen collisions. Now, Chris McKay, Ralph Lorenz, and I looked at this many years ago, and um, I'm not going to show, it's in the package, which you'll have, but I'm not going to show the chart because it's hopelessly complicated. Um, it turns out that whether the atmosphere stabilizes in radiative equilibrium at a lower temperature due to this effect or whether it actually snows out, because as the temperature goes down, you approach the nitrogen condensation point, and the nitrogen begins to condense out. Turns out that it depends on the luminosity of the sun. So in the present epoch, with the solar luminosity at its current value, the atmosphere never collapses. But two billion years ago, or three billion years ago, uh, if methane uh, was lost for some period of time, and the atmosphere is purely nitrogen, it would have frozen out. And so um, rather than showing you the chart, I'll show you the technical illustration of that by Chesley Bonstell. He did this painting back 60 years ago, and it certainly isn't Titan today, but it could be Titan <coughs> during early epochs when the solar luminosity was 80% or less of the present values at times when methane was absent from the atmosphere, and this would then be nitrogenized. So it could, at times, look something like Triton. And now, how would you test for this? Well, if we had really good um, uh, radar data uh, of impact craters, you'd look for fields of impact craters uh, that have diameters too small uh, to be caused by impactors in the present-day epoch when you have a very dense atmosphere which will screen out impactors that are less than a half a kilometer, a kilometer in size. Now, actually, we have that resolution, but uh, in uh, one of the problems with the, the, the radar data, as far as impact craters go, is uh, that there are, are a number of 
um, of impact craters that are well defined, like these, that are rather large in size. But when you get down to the ones that are uh, sort of of interesting size, they really become quite faint and, and vague. And there are a number of things that I sort of personally call crop circles, uh, even at smaller scale than this, uh, kilometer scale, which you might argue are impact craters, but have simply been buried by the sediments and are just not so evident. The problem is it's hard to know with the radar data. So uh, this is from a paper by Chuck Wood and colleagues. Um, uh, many craters may be buried in the organic sediment, the smaller ones. That's unfortunate because it would be through the identification of small impact craters uh, that one could assess whether there have been epochs where the atmosphere has been much thinner than at present. With the impact craters that, that are seen, here are some examples of these. Um, one can put together a chart of uh, the age of the surface. This one's a little old. I should have used a more recent one. But the bottom line is that the age of Titan's surface is somewhere around a few hundred million years old from the point of view of crater counting. Now, how much of that is due to burial? How much is due to cryovolcanism and resurfacing? How much is due to atmospheric screening um, is, is, is not really clear. If Titan had a, 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 has had a thin crust throughout history, um, as I'll argue in a minute, um, it would be very hard to maintain the bulk of the craters. Uh, and uh, so that would be one way to make the surface look youthful. So this um, argues then for a surface that is really not like Callisto. If, if, if Titan were like Callisto, had a thick, rigid lithosphere, um, one should see a, a larger number of craters than one actually sees. And so Titan does seem to be more youthful than Callisto, despite some arguments that people have made to the contrary. I'm going to spend the next five minutes before we take our coffee break on that particular model. Uh, and um, it's a model that depends on a few different observations uh, from the chemical point of view. So first of all, this is a model of the interior of, uh, of Titan and its evolution through time. And I'll explain the colors in a minute. It's a model, of course, in which Titan is dominated by rock and and water ice, but Titan also contains a few percent ammonia. And the arguments for ammonia are twofold. Number one, ammonia has been detected in Enceladus, which is a neighboring moon, directly by the ion neutral mass spectrometer. But number two, a measurement of the argon to nitrogen ratio in Titan's atmosphere gives a value that is four orders of magnitude lower than the solar abundance of argon to nitrogen. Argon has a similar volatility to molecular nitrogen. And Toby Owen argued uh, uh, now 30, almost 30 years ago that a test for the origin of nitrogen on Titan would be to measure the argon abundance. If nitrogen came into Titan as nitrogen at the beginning, then because the argon and nitrogen volatilities are similar, the argon to nitrogen ratio should be roughly solar. There are refined arguments that give it a factor of 10 less, but close to solar. If it came in as ammonia, then because ammonia is so much less volatile than argon, ammonia could have been incorporated under warmer conditions that would have excluded the argon and led to an argon to nitrogen ratio well below solar. And that's exactly what's seen in measurements by the GCMS and the INMS. So we include ammonia. And then the presence of methane in Titan's interior implies that large amounts of Titan's ice through time will actually not simply be water ice, but will be methane clathrate hydrate, which readily forms uh, under the conditions in Titan. Now, gas hydrates of methane have become infamous because that's what prevented BP petroleum from putting the containment dome over the oil spill. Um, but it also forms on Titan. So this is now a thermal history of Titan putting these components together, rock, water, small amount of ammonia, and methane. And that's all. There are undoubtedly others. The color code here is the orange is the atmosphere. Uh, dark blue is liquid water and ammonia. Light blue is high pressure ice. And then brown to red, depending on the temperature, is the silicate. We assume that the metal is with the silicate. We don't do anything with that. 
Um, accretion, the formation of Titan, leads to heating during the later stages of Titan's formation. You end up with a mixed core of rock and ice overlain by a pure rock uh, layer overlain by liquid water. This is a very, very warm and very transient uh, epoch. In fact, this now is sort of the history of the upper 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers. This is time in billions of years. Um, very quickly, uh, the radioactive heating of this rock and the rock in here melts this ice. You get core overturn, differentiation, the reaction of this high pressure ice in the liquid with whatever methane is present and cooling at the same time leads to methane clathrate formation. And that's what you see here. Now what's important about methane clathrate is it has thermal and viscous properties, rheologic properties, very different from water ice. It has a much lower thermal conductivity and a much higher rigidity than normal water ice if one believes the experimental data. And so very quickly, Unlike a standard interior model of Titan, which is shown now by this red dashed line, the crust of Titan does not thicken, but it stays thin for long periods of time. In fact, it stays thin. You know what? This scale got compressed by some kind of <coughs> Mac, Mac problem. So zero is over here. I apologize for that. Just stretch this scale out, OK? Zero is over here, one, and so on. I don't know what happened. But anyway. Um, up until the last half billion years of Titan's history, the crust is entirely methane clathrate and is very thin. Um, there is a period where the core becomes hot enough that it actually starts to convect, and that release of heat should degas the methane clathrate hydrate. And then in the current epoch, water ice one is uh, beginning to thicken and form a thicker crust of 50 kilometers or more today. Convection in that would occasionally release methane from the now much thinner clathrate hydrate crust. So if this model represents what Titan is doing, then Titan has had a thin crust through much of its history, and it would be hard to maintain craters. But it also provides for a few discrete episodes where methane is outgassed, one early in its history, one when core convection begins, and one when ice one convection begins near the surface. The rest of this time, the methane, again, may be very much absent from the atmosphere because its lifetime is only on the order of 100 million years. This is an extreme model. There are other models uh, in which uh, the, the crust is thick throughout Titan's history. And um, unfortunately, distinguishing between these, given the, the blanketing effect of the atmosphere, uh, uh, the blanketing effect on the surface of the organics deposited from the atmosphere is going to be very, very difficult. Um, and trying to find a way in a future mission to distinguish between these two I think is going to be very important. So we'll take a coffee break. After the break, I've got about another 15-minute tutorial, and then I'll close with my list of questions. Uh, and then we have a half hour of Q&A. So, okay. This program is brought to you by Caltech. Visit us at caltech.edu.